Now we're going to use the same command that we did with our one-way ANOVA. The command is simply ANOVA, but there are actually a couple different ways that we can uh, perform the omnibus in Stata. Not only do we have to identify the independent variables, but we also have to let Stata know to assess the interaction between the two. So the first method is ANOVA, the DV attract, followed by our two independent variables on their own. So the main effect of sex, the main effect of pints, and you have to identify an interaction term here. So the interaction between sex and pints is simply sex hash pints. So you can either, you would use the hash symbol or the pound symbol to tell Stata to, to assess the interaction. That's the longhand way of, of writing out this command. Or you can use the command ANOVA, the DV attract, and followed by sex and pints with two hashes in between. That's telling Stata to do both the main effects of sex and pints, as well as the interaction. Either command, you'll get the same exact output. All right, when we run the command, we get this, ANO this ANOVA table. All right, so let's go ahead and break up this table piece by piece. All right, Stata gives us the number of total observations in the data set as well as the R squared. We can interpret the R squared just as we have before. We just have a few more variables to include. In this case, an R squared of 0.6111 simply means 61.11% of the variability in attractiveness ratings. be explained by a participant sex and alcohol consumption. All right, so over 60% of the variability in attractiveness ratings can be accounted for by sex and alcohol consumption. That's one measure of an effect size. Now, as with before with the one-way ANOVA, we do get a model line, but this time the model line should look very different to um, the factors. And in fact, we really don't need to interpret the model line here. It doesn't really give us any useful information. The only value you really need to consider in the model line is the degrees of freedom for the model. And I'll talk about how, how we assess degrees of freedom for each main effect, interaction and error or the residual degrees of freedom. All right, so let's assess the factor line for sex. Is there an influence of gender or sex on attractiveness ratings? The degrees of freedom for this variable or for this factor is one. Remember that degrees of freedom for each factor is the number of levels minus one. In this case, sex is binary for these data. So two minus one is one. The F statistic for this main effect is 2.03, and it's associated with a non-significant p-value. So with this non-significant F ratio, we would conclude that there is no significant difference in attractiveness ratings as a function of participant sex. So this would be a non-significant main effect because the p is greater than 0.05. At this stage, we'll always be comparing P against 0.05. The next line tells us the main effect of pints. So our next factor is pints. We have three levels. So the degrees of freedom for pints is two. Three minus one is two. The F ratio is 20.07. And it is a significant P value. In this case, the P is less than 0.001. So we do have a main effect of pints, which essentially means that there is an influence of pints or number of pints consumed on attractiveness ratings. But remember that this variable has three levels, which means we don't know where the significant differences really are. If we wanted to know the influence of pints on attractiveness ratings, regardless of gender or regardless of sex, we would have to do post hoc analyses. So that is a significant main effect. And if we wanted to probe that effect further, we would have to do post hoc analyses. But again, that's qualified by a potential significant interaction. If you have a significant interaction, you're gonna get a lot more detail from your simple effects analysis 
rather than a postdoc analysis after a main effect. Right, so let's interpret the final line, the interaction between sex and pints. To calculate the degrees of freedom for an interaction, all you do is multiply the degrees of freedom for the two factors that you're including in the, the interaction. In this case, the degrees of freedom for sex is one, and the degrees of freedom for pints is two. So the degrees of freedom for an interaction, so the degrees of freedom for the interaction is the number of levels for factor A or factor one minus one. times the number of levels for factor B or factor two minus one. All right, so the degrees of freedom for sex by pints equals two times one. That's how we get our degrees of freedom here of two. And the F ratio for this interaction is 11.91 and this is statistically significant. So for this example, we do have a significant interaction. And in order to understand the interaction further, we would do what are called simple effects analyses. And that's exactly what we're gonna do next week. So after today, you should have a good understanding of the difference between main effects and interactions. And then next week, we'll learn how to treat um, a significant interaction. Let's finish up interpreting the ANOVA output here. Again, we have a significant interaction here and we've identified the degrees of freedom for all of our factors. Lastly, we want to find out how to get the degrees of freedom residual. And to do that, we actually have to get the model degrees of freedom. So our model degrees of freedom in this top line, that's simply the addition of each of these degrees of freedom here. So the degrees of freedom for sex plus pints plus the interaction. In this case, one plus two plus two is five. And then finally, the degrees of freedom residual is degrees of freedom total minus degrees of freedom model. So in a factorial ANOVA, The degrees of freedom again is df total minus df model. In this case, that's 47 minus 5. So when you report each either main effect or interaction, you'll use the degrees of freedom for the factor and degrees of freedom residual. So for our first non significant main effect, you'd report F with the degrees of freedom one and 42 equals 2.03 and the P equals 0.16. Now you really should be italicizing F and P here, but I can't italicize in using Zoom, using the annotations. Just know, yeah, you really should be doing that when you're reporting an APA. All right, so next we have the main effect of pints. F, this time the degrees of freedom are two and 42, equals 20.07. And the significant P in this case is less than 0 0.001. Remember when Stata prints out a P value of zero, it's never exactly zero. So the best way to write this out would be less than 0 0.001. All right, finally, the interaction, the degrees of freedom are two and 42, and the F equals 11.91, and our P in this case, again, is less than 0 0.001. Even though Stata wrote, printed the P of 0 0.0001, when you're writing out a report, it's best to round to three decimal places at the most you really shouldn't be rounding to four decimal places. It makes things look messier and a little bit harder to interpret. Now, the next thing I wanna highlight here is how we can find or determine the F ratio with limited information. So if you're only given partial sum of squares 
the number of observations and the number of levels in each independent variable, you can actually pretty easily come to the, the correct F ratio. The first thing you'd have to do, of course, is identify the degrees of freedom, which we've already done here. To calculate the F ratio for sex, all you have to do is divide the sum of squares for sex divided by degrees of freedom. This one is particularly easy because degrees of freedom is one. So the sum of squares for sex is the mean square for sex. Then to calculate the F ratio for this variable, you divide the mean square for that factor divided by mean square residual. So in this case, 168.75 divided by 83 gives us an F ratio of 2.03. And you can do the same for each factor as well as for the interaction. So the F ratio is simply mean square for whatever factor you're assessing divided by mean square residual. All right, so each of these F ratios include this residual mean square in its calculation. And remember that this mean square residual term is essentially all of the variability in the data set that isn't accounted for by our manipulation. So this is variability and attractiveness that can't be explained by sex, pints, or the interaction. On the other hand, mean square for each factor is the variability and attractiveness that can be accounted for by our manipulation. Therefore, the larger the F ratio, the better, the more variability we're explaining by the manipulation. Now, I really wanted to highlight this because this is definitely something you might see on an exam or a quiz. Um, for any assessment, you'll always be given the partial sum of squares, but you'll definitely want to know how to calculate degrees of freedom, mean square, and the F ratio. All right, so even though this is a little bit more complex, this design is more complex compared to the one-way ANOVA we assessed the weeks before, we're really not interpreting anything differently here. Rather than one F ratio to interpret, we now have three F ratios to interpret. But again, we interpret them pretty much exactly the same. We'll assess um, significance at P of 0.05. And if we have a significant F ratio for our main effects, that simply means that each independent variable alone is influencing the dependent variable. And a significant interaction means that the combined influence of our independent variables influence the dependent variable. So factorial ANOVA is really just an extension of the one-way ANOVAs we looked at in the last few weeks. All right, so the last thing we're gonna assess today with these data is testing the assumption of homogeneity of variance or equal variability. Remember that one of the assumptions of ANOVA is that we have equal variability in our dependent variable at all levels of the independent variable. So I'm gonna clear out all of this text and demonstrate how we can get that. Now, this will actually have to be done in two steps. Because we want to assess variability at each level of each IV, we'll actually have to generate a new variable here. And this new variable is essentially going to be an identifier for each specific cell. So the command to create this new variable is simply egen, you can name it whatever you want. We're going to name it cell because, again, these identify each specific cell, right? And we're going to create this new variable by grouping sex and pints. So we want a new identifier for males at zero pints, males at two pints, males at four pints, females at zero, two, and four pints. All right, we run that command and we can see we have our new variable. And if we look at our variable viewer, we can see that we have uh, one is identified for males at zero, four is identified for females at zero, two is the identifier for males at two pints, and so forth. So we have a variable here called cell, and it's just for each individual cell. So it's one through six. And this is what we're gonna to use to, um, to conduct the Levine's test of equal variability. So the command again is rope var, 
and our dependent variable attract by this new variable cell. Now, if we only included sex here, this would give us Levine's test for equal variability by sex alone. Same with pints. If we included pints, it would give us Levine's for pints alone. In this case, we're actually able to get Levine's for each level of both of our independent variables. All right, and the null hypothesis for Levine's test simply states that the standard deviation in attractiveness ratings is the same at all cells or standard deviation one equals standard deviation two equals three equals four equals five equals six. And we'll only interpret this p-value up top. In this case, we have a non-significant p-value of 0 0.20, which means we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Again, this is a good thing with Levine's test. We're failing to reject this null hypothesis which means our standard deviations are equal at each level of ratings, or sorry, our standard deviation for attractiveness is the same at all levels of both of our independent variables. So we have not violated the assumption of homogeneity of variance here. All right, so the next thing I'm gonna demonstrate is simply how to visualize this variable in Stata.